Is it water with the sheep in the in the box? All right, look, I admit that I've kind of covered topics adjacent to this in the past, and it is something that I might end up returning to again in the future, because it's something that really gets to me. It just gets under my skin and makes me feel incredibly frustrated, and so, well, here we are. Weirdly, it all seems to return to the same couple of people perpetuating these bad ideas over and over again, but I'm not really going to get too far into personal attacks here. I don't care about attacking specific people as much as their ideas, at least on YouTube. On Twitter sometimes I will get spicy and go off on someone if they're being particularly shitty, but that's quite rare nowadays, and I only do it if I observe something extremely harmful. Regardless, this isn't going to be an excuse for me to go off on a single law student implying that a survivor of child sex trafficking is pedo-adjacent based on little to no evidence, or suggesting that wearing flip-flops is a sex act, but buying a child sex slave is not. I would distinguish and say that the reason why that does not apply is because that person, we can reasonably surmise, was not primarily engaging in a sexual act at that time. They were looking at me to buy me. And, all right, and you are, and I know that you are trying to just be as overly inflammatory as possible. This is not so And I would say, I would say that in that situation, the thing they are primarily focusing on was the buying. That's what my answer would be. And I know that you're just going to respond with, oh my God, Riley, you're so terrible. I left. The guy, the guy who wanted to buy my holes. The main thing he was thinking about was the buying. <laughs> Reprehensible though a person saying these things might be, and disgusting though that behavior undoubtedly is, because that's not really my lane, and a number of people have done that already. Plus, of course, discourse and internet drama like that will likely have already moved on by the time this video is posted, and I'm more interested in having my position on the record and having a handy tool for future reference whenever this topic comes up again, which will probably be next Pride, than winning some dumb internet debate. Now, today we're going to be talking about the very concept of a leftist prude, and how the idea is, frankly, absurd. Excuse me, do you think that bikinis should be banned? Well, I most certainly do, and I don't think it does justice to a woman's figure. I think that there's nothing so beautiful and so, uh, well, I say, would attract attention to the um, streamlined and the beautiful woman's figure so much as the uh, one, the piece with the skirt, which um, I think in silhouette looks simply beautiful, but the bikini, no, definitely not. The main question that comes up a lot in these discussions is what degree of sexuality is permissible around children? And this is, of course, an extremely sensitive and subjective topic of conversation. What counts as sex? Where do we draw the line? Now, as a leftist degenerate slut, I would probably draw the line somewhere further towards the more liberal end of the sliding scale, where one end is full anal fisting in the street and the other is Victorian era, don't show your ankles, ladies, puritanism. But obviously, I do draw the line somewhere between wearing flip-flops is okay and sucking someone's cock while wearing a leather dog suit in Tesco's is okay. There's probably quite a lot of middle ground there, you know? So how much sexuality is acceptable to introduce to children's lives? The immediate reaction response is none, but then we get to the rather difficult discussions around, like, what is sexual? Can we teach consent? Whether it be as simple as it's okay to say no if you don't want to hurt grandma to kids? Can we teach sex ed or even safe sex to them? What counts as sexual? Is making out sexual? Is nakedness? Why? Let's take it point by point and briefly go over each, shall we? You may claim it's ridiculous to equate sex ed to, for example, showing pornography to kids, and I would definitely agree, but devoid of context, the two are very similar, at least aesthetically, showing sex and sex act to children. So, context and intent are important then, but how do we determine something like intent? One of the main issues that got brought up during the most recent debacle when it came to this sort of stuff was fetishes and kinks. 
things, which we'll go into in a little more depth soon, but the fact is that if you're into, for example, feet, then for you, someone wearing sandals would be incredibly arousing, but that doesn't necessarily mean that everyone wearing sandals is always sexual, and it would be impossible to determine whether or not someone was wearing sandals for comfort because it's hot out or to appease some kind of foot fetish, which makes trying to objectively measure intent a useless exercise. After all, if you, for example, were to decide that it should be illegal or at least incur some kind of potential punishment to appeal to your or a partner's sexual desires in public, then that opens Pandora's box and doesn't seem to really take into account that sometimes people lie about their intentions. And then begins the slippery slope towards puritanism. If getting your toes out for a partner in public is public indecency, then is wearing a low-cut top? Is wearing booty shorts? Is beach wear? If something as innocuous as sandals can be deemed overtly sexual around children, then how can we justify bikinis and short skirts? Should we return to modesty culture? Should we enforce a culture of modesty perhaps? After all, if it's immoral to be in any way sexual in public, and sometimes these ways of dressing and presenting can be described as sexual under some but not all contexts, then well what's to stop us becoming Victorian England, Mormon Utah or Saudi Arabia and preventing women being able to express themselves as they see fit? For example, as we all know, Dennis Prager finds women's legs just as attractive as a foot fetishist might find a lovely set of toes. Let's be honest, there is no magazine featuring men's legs for women to look at and get aroused by. But there are websites and magazines of women's legs for men. I recall a famous liquor ad that showed a woman's legs and a bottle of tequila. No face, just beautiful legs. Women don't get excited by virtually every male body at the beach. Male legs don't turn them on like female legs turn men on, etc, mm. etc. Et so if he and his wife were to go out in public, should she be allowed to wear a short skirt? Should she be stopped from doing so by illegal means in case a child might see? Likewise, I'm a big fan of boobs, but if I were to be out with someone and they were to wear a revealing top, whilst I wouldn't exactly start jacking off in public or anything, it is something that I would appreciate in a sexual way, but who are we to determine specific parts of people's bodies inherently sexual? In many cultures, nakedness, breasts, bums, even genitals, are not inherently sexual. It's an arbitrary Western thing that somehow come out of our overt sexualization of the human body over the centuries. However we do it, it's going to be arbitrary and basically pointless anyway. The classic example here is the female presenting nipples thing, which is a reference to the fact that various social media sites consider the nipples of a female presenting person to be obscene or inherently sexual, but not those attached to men or male presenting people. This kind of double standard gets absurd very quickly as people noticed that in theory these policies meant that they could essentially photoshop men's nipples, which of course are visually identical to women's nipples, onto boobs and technically that would then be acceptable and within the rules, whereas the opposite would not, even though there is functionally no discernible difference. Likewise, as trans people began to become more and more prominent and visible in public spaces and especially online, the question became, well, at what point does a trans woman's nipple become unacceptable? Obviously, after a while on hormones, trans women grow boobs that are identical to a cis woman's boobs, so there has to be a point where they do get banned, but where is that point? If a trans woman took a picture of her nipples every day for several years, both pre and post coming out and pre and post HRT, where would the line be drawn? Also, of course, this whole thing necessarily dismisses the experiences and cultures of not only indigenous people and groups, but also the totality of human history and just how we as a species have lived throughout most of our existence. For example, it's only recently that we've started living in multi room houses and in some places in the world there are places where people still don't. And of course sex and sexuality is not always a taboo across cultures. Indeed, until colonisation many indigenous African groups were open and extremely liberal about sex and sexuality, treating it as sacred, important and far from taboo. Likewise, many indigenous Native American groups practiced very liberal attitudes to gender and sexuality for hundreds if not thousands of years before encountering European Puritanism and Christian shame for any sexual feeling whatsoever, and as mentioned, often these groups were perfectly happy and content living as a family in individual huts or small one-room dwellings where, of course, they would be able to have sex, sometimes in front of children. Are we to denounce these practices and this way of life as inherently pedo-adjacent? Considering that throughout much of European history we've been
been actively marrying off young teenage girls to adult men, and that some places in the West still have laws enabling marrying a minor to an adult, we don't really have much of a leg to stand on here if we're going to start being dicks about it. There is simply no way to prevent subtle displays of sexuality and to protect kids from sexuality more broadly without a bioessentialist gender binary heavily restricting the rights to freedom of expression and presentation of just about everyone, but especially women and femme presenting people, and at the end of the day, all you've done is taught kids to hate and fear intimacy and sexuality in all its forms, and to instill an idea of shame around any kind of immodesty and overt sexuality, which is probably a little bit more harmful to kids in general than, than discovering, exploring, and interacting with sexuality in a healthy, natural way. But what about when it's especially out there, abnormal or unusual? Some are in drag, some are not. But they don't, they don't, they don't really mind you as long as you... Um... So not bother them and not stare so much. The last time this was brought up was in regards to kink at Pride, which I did talk about at the time, but it needs to be said that not all kink is inherently sexual. Indeed, in many ways kink is more wholesome and less overtly sexual than vanilla people's sex lives, because as it turns out, human sexuality is infinitely varied and complex, so let's talk about kink then. Where does kink come from? Well, it's a very complex situation, but generally the answer is one of three main causes. A trauma response, an association due to to an early sexual experience, personality type, or a simple combination of all of the above. Indeed, in trauma therapy circles, there's an oft-repeated truism that children process trauma through play, adults through kink. For example, someone who may have had a traumatic experience that involved a lack of control or safety might gravitate to a sub-dom dynamic, either as a dom where they get to be the one in control for once, or as a sub where they get to act out the sensation and experience of being controlled in a safe setting, knowing that the person dominating them loves and cares deeply about them. From speaking to friends of mine who are into BDSM culture a lot more deeply than myself, I've experimented but rarely partaken personally, the sub gets to give up the responsibility and chaos of their everyday life and be taken to a safe, loving place where they don't have to deal with their day-to-day -day problems, and the dom likewise gets to look after and care for the sub with the strong bond of trust between them ensuring that the experience is mutual and consensual, as either party can stop at any time. This of course is most evident during sexual activity, but it can also be true outside of that context as well. Subdom dynamics can be, and sometimes are, taken outside of the bedroom and the couple being sexual. And the couple can live permanently as subdom, both getting the benefits from this dynamic without it necessarily being sexual. For example, the comfort and love a sub can get from being looked after and being told that they're a good little subby boy, aren't they, can be a powerful feeling, just as the feeling of control and desire to care for and protect a partner can be for a dom. Is this dynamic really all that different from a traditional cis-het relationship? where the man is the breadwinner and is supposed to look after the wife who is the homemaker. If anything, that's much more sexual in nature because the nuclear family requires numerous children whereas some dumb dynamic doesn't even require sex. In theory, you could have a non-sexual BDSM relationship with someone. We've spoken in the previous section about foot fetishes and their similarity to people being into legs, boobs, butts and so on, but in our quest to demystify kinks, we kind of need to talk about the elephant in the room. Let's talk then about the good faith wearer of a gimp suit. You asked me why you wouldn't be able to, or why you would be able to grope your partner's uh, breasts in public. I would say that you would not be able is to. Is it a sex act? To grope? I would say it is not a sex act, but because we're looking primarily at intent, when we surmise what a sex act is, then any reasonable person would look at that and still say that we ought not allow that kind of behavior in public. Why? This is also the reason why, even though Wait, you why? may have the situation with the good faith wearer of like a gimp suit. We could imagine where you have instances where like someone wears a gimp suit just because they like the feel of it or whatever. We would still say that you aren't allowed to do that around people because the primary intention of wearing that thing, of doing that thing, is for sexual purposes, right? Like in the situation you described, like grabbing, even if you're not like trying like to, even if you're not appealing taste. to a partner's sexual desire. Most people would look at that kind of behavior and understand that's usually what people are doing. It is, in fact, possible for something to be both kink and non-sexual, as it turns out. Don't get me wrong here, though. I understand and appreciate that some stuff is not generally socially accepted or acceptable, and I'm not going to try and convince you that we should normalize, like, full-on fetish gear or performing explicit kink scenes in public, though events like Pride can be an exception, as I discussed at length previously. However, I feel it necessary to acknowledge and discuss the clear similarities between 
between, for example, something like a wedding ring or even a purity ring, which is inherently sexual, though from the opposite direction, and something like a subtle or even unsubtle sub-collar. Honestly, if you walk down the street and see someone wearing something like this, are you going to be upset or offended or even notice? This kind of collar is indistinguishable from a number of other stylized necklaces, and even more obvious ones aren't too far off alt or punk fashion accessories. Would a Wonder Woman cosplay be inappropriate to wear in public, and what is more sexual than an item of jewellery that explicitly states that you've pledged yourself to only be fucked by one specific person for the rest of your life? We could even take this to a ridiculous extreme and claim that being in public with your kids is an inappropriate sexual boast because it signifies that you had sex and got cream pied in the past or something. This is a very silly argument. The problem here is that these sorts of arguments, the ones that claim that people practicing non-standard social and or sexual lifestyles or sexual practices are inherently sexual or obscene, are the exact ones that were, and occasionally still are, used in order to victimise LGBTQ plus people for decades. The queers, the argument used to go, are inherently sexual and merely holding hands, kissing or whatever, was an overt display of obscenity, whereas the same behaviour from a heterosexual couple simply wouldn't be. Which is why publications like Gay News, the UK's most prominent gay magazine during the 80s, kept being banned under obscenity laws despite, well, not being obscene. The contradiction comes from bigotry, not logic. After all, if a couple of gay fellas kissing and holding hands on a date isn't inherently sexual, then surely the same could be said of a straight couple. If gay news is obscene, is Cosmo not also? And yet we, the gays, are not out here demanding that the straights get a room and stop shoving their degenerate lifestyles and or sexualities down our throats already, are we? Sure, people who are into kink are not on the same level as, say, gay people, but this rhetoric that's currently being used against them should sound familiar to anyone who's spoken to a homophobe recently. Likewise, the same is happening with trans people these days. The very existence of a trans woman is seen as a heinous sexual act or some shit, and it's their fault that people start to speculate about what's in her pants. It's just the nature of trans degeneracy. At its core, it's a disgust response, with a hastily cobbled together justification tacked on so as not to be outed as a bigot. This we must keep kinks and other degeneracy away from our kids narrative is really not a million miles away from we must keep homosexuality and other degeneracy out of the classroom, which of course is where harmful anti-LGBTQ plus legislation like section 28 came from. The simple question we must demand an answer to is this. Why? Why must we protect kids from even the most mild and harmless displays of sexuality at all times, and why is this demand so inconsistent? <laughs> Prudes have no place on the left, and especially in queer spaces. Our movement exists to push back against and resist the restrictive and puritanical status quo, to challenge norms and preconceptions, and to support radical ideas like equality is good and bigotry is bad. We reject assimilationism and gatekeeping, we embrace anyone from all walks of life, and we stand for justice and fairness, regardless of social acceptance or whatever polite society has to say. As leftists, living and existing within a society that demonises and creates a culture culture of fear and insecurity around sex and sexuality, especially so-called abnormal and or different aspects of self-expression and sexual desire, we should oppose any attempts to reinforce the harmful, prudish status quo that is often pushed by society and the media on the face of it, but especially when it boils down to nothing more than a pathetic disgust response. This, along with the often misused what about the children defence, has often been used to harm and victimise marginalised people and groups under the guise of protecting the vulnerable. This sort of logic is what leads to Section 28, and whilst, yes, obviously being gay isn't the same as being a gimp or whatever, let's not forget that most of the time this rhetoric is being directed towards the LGBTQ plus community anyway, what with the main discourse surrounding pride and targeting specific LGBTQ plus people online, but this rhetoric and the attitude that abnormal or non-standard examples of sexuality or self-expression are degenerate or harmful to children is nothing new, and someone using these arguments is indicative of the kind of views of people outside of the cis-heteronormative expectations enforced by society might be. Let's not pretend that our version of society, how we live, the way we decide to organise and view concepts like these, is any better or worse than people of the past and or people of different cultures who may have been more sexually permissive. Views on what should be acceptable within society, in public spaces, etc., are arbitrary and constantly evolving, and trying to hold anyone accountable for contradicting or failing to live up to these standards is, at best, 
a pointless endeavor and at worst a harmful one. There is no way to objectively measure what counts as a sex act and what should be allowed in public because these things are highly subjective and trying to do so only leads to doing incredibly dumb shits like unironically arguing that wearing sandals is an unacceptably graphic sexual display but buying a potential child sex slave is not sexual because it's more of a transaction which is disgusting, shameful and embarrassing for those on what has come to be known as the prude left. A wank, I think.